So what I'd want to start by talking about is about lines and symbols, okay? They call it an alphabet of lines. So we need to be able to understand what all these different lines and symbols on blueprints mean. So again, I'm working directly from chapter four in the book, okay? You'll see there's a reason for me doing this. But let's go ahead and take a look at chapter four, okay? When we look at a print like this, okay, we see that there's whole different line weights. For example, over on the left-hand side, we have a dimension line. It's a solid line, has two endpoints, and always has a measurement, okay? Those are dimension lines. You also see this, this 35 feet broken down further into separate dimension lines. Now, you also have what's known as a cutting plane line. It basically tells you that there's another reference over here. At this point, there's another drawing, okay, that shows you exactly what's a part of that wall, okay? There's also additional, um, like, they're called leaders, but basically it's an arrow with some text in it that tells you something about it, okay? They're pointers. We have extension lines, okay? This corner here, okay, it just basically says this measurement endpoint, this is the 1.5, the extension line to, on the bottom left, because I'm not sure if you can see my mouse pointer. But this extension line on the bottom left, where we have a one, one foot five inch and a corner, we have an extension line, all it does is extend that wall out to say, okay, the outside of that wall is where my one foot five inch is. So all of that, all of these details is what we call the alphabet of lines, okay? And the column line symbols, all of this basically says, look for this symbol someplace else, and it tells you what it is. Okay, a leader line, okay, basically says, here, point here, here's a text, and this is what we need to do with it. For example, this is a concrete, um, this is a concrete base, they're basically saying bevel all the edges. In other words, they don't want sharp corners. It's a safety feature. So we're talking about, you're gonna see examples of center lines, thin lines to indicate centers of objects. It's important to pour the footings in the right places. Dimension lines and extension lines and leaders. We also have break lines. Okay, and I'm gonna show you examples of this. Okay, section cutting. Okay, arrow shows the direction the section is facing. So if you see this on a print pointing to something that you have to be worried about, like a mechanical component or something, you need to find where this A5 is because there's a more broken down version of that. For example, if you're installing a boiler, they might have a breakdown of exactly how the piping has to be laid out in that boiler install at section A5. Okay, so anytime you have a print and another section number, you have to look for that additional section to see if there's gonna be a blown up view of what you're looking for. Okay, now the most important part of these prints that I really think is important for HVAC technicians is the legends. Okay, what the different symbols mean. Okay, our measurements are great because we have to use them for sizing, we have to use them for figuring out ductwork. But the most important part for HVAC installers and HVAC technicians is to understand the symbols. For example, you have a different symbol for the two by four, two by six wall studs without insulation. You have a two by four, two by six wall stud with insulation and you'll have foil-faced bat insulation that tells you exactly, so you know exactly what's in those walls. Why is that important for an HVAC technician to understand? Why do I care about what's in that wall? Anybody? Um, in case you need to go through the wall. Well, yeah. 
uh, because if I'm cutting a register in, it would help to know if I have an insulated wall or an uninsulated wall. What about if I have to drop a thermostat wire through a wall? Can it make a difference whether or not it's insulated or not insulated? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not insulated, that thermostat wire is going to drop nicely down that wall. But if it's insulated, I'm going to have a real tough time getting that thermostat wire through that wall. Okay, I might pass it off to the electricians because, strictly speaking, according to code, it's their job anyways. So, I mean, it's it's basically how what's in the wall can I get through the wall and what type of additional protections do I need to take with the wall one of the biggest things people forget about in new construction believe it or not the bathroom walls your bathroom walls in new construction are insulated and a lot of times that can cause a lot of problems for people running ductwork piping and stuff like that you don't realize that those bathroom walls are insulated, but they are. It's to cut down co on noise and, quite honestly, humidity passing through the walls. So bathroom walls a lot of times are insulated. Now, we worry about this is just an example of some of the other things we can see. Okay, recessed lighting fixtures, night light fixtures, exit lights, exhaust fans, the exhaust fans are something extremely important for HVAC technicians. Because you know what? The electricians could have put in the fan. You're going to put in the ductwork that connects that fan. Okay, so the electricians most likely will wire that fan and put it in place. But the ductwork that comes out of it is your responsibility. So you've got to look for these things on the um, prints. Um, recessed lighting. Why does recessed lighting make a difference? These are the recessed lighting containers in a ceiling. Why does that make a difference? For running ductwork. Yeah, that's one. There's another ductwork. Yeah, you cannot run ductwork over recessed lighting. But what's a, there's another reason as well that I have to be aware of recessed lighting. Um, return and supply vents. Yeah, that's, and there's, again, that's, yeah, I can't put a return or supply vent right where the recessed light is. What about heat transfer? Um, does recessed lighting break the thermal barrier of a ceiling? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if a recessed light isn't insulated properly, it acts like a, basically a chimney a very powerful chimney as it warms up that pulls air out of a house into an attic. So recessed lighting can actually cause a lot of problems with hot and cold and energy loss. Um, even if it's like if you have a first floor and a second floor and you have recessed lighting in the ceiling of the first floor, you would think I wouldn't have energy loss to the second floor. Well, a lot of people don't think that anyways, but that floor area is open. And that, that heat can pass through the floor area to one of those side walls. And if things aren't sealed properly, which a lot of times they're not, that heat can just go right up to the attic. So you can actually create a chimney effect, hot air rises, with the heat going directly to the attic. So that's something we always have to be worried about, especially in residential. Now, down a little bit further, we have a square symbol that's a lighting symbol. It says two by two recessed light fixtures with lens, okay? Two by two recessed lighting, okay? That could be like a drop ceiling or something like that. I can, again, I cannot run ductwork over those light fixtures. It's very important, okay? Those light fixtures heat up, okay? They're just get in the way, but you can't run ductwork directly over them. Now, what about thermostat wire? This is something very important in a commercial building. Can I run thermostat wire near light fixtures? I wouldn't do it. Why? Because of the extra heat. Okay, heat is one reason, but there was something else I was looking for. Um, I know some of you guys were working on the um, on that deli unit, the one with the glass front in the shop while I was up there, and we had a little bit of a discussion about ballasts. What do ballasts produce that can cause a lot of problems with um, thermostat wire? Magnetism. 
Fluorescent lighting is not clean with electric and with electronics. Okay, fluorescent lighting puts off a lot of electronic noise. We call it thermostat wire run over fluorescent light fixtures can actually pick up this noise and really mess up building control systems. It's not as bad with 24 volt thermostats, but the minute you go into sensors, okay, it starts becoming very bad. Um, the night instructor at, in HVAC, Stephen, and I had a conversation about this because the faculty area of the York building was over like 80 or 90 degrees while I was up there. And we actually traced it down to a sensor issue. Part of the issue with a sensor was that it was being run over fluorescent light fixtures and it was giving bad some pretty bad signals to the um, controller, to the thermostat. So we had to make some changes on what the controller was expecting to get that area back under temperature control. So when you run um, sensor wire, thermostat wire, or anything in a commercial building, you really have to look where you're running it. So again, it's very important to understand on prints where these light fixtures are. Because if you have to run a thermostat wire directly over a light fixture to get it down the wall, to where you want to put the sensor, you probably have to put your sensor in a different location. It's much easier to move the sensor than it is to move a lot of lighting. So electronics has to, electronic noise has to be part of your planning on where to put stuff. Okay, so um, there's also, those are some lighting symbols, okay, that are pretty important. Then we have um, abbreviations that are going to show up on the blueprints. Okay, we have a stuff like acoustical tile. It might say above finished floor. Okay, so all of this stuff, downspouts, are extremely important when you're talking about where to place condensers. If you see a downspout labeled on the side of a building, do you want to put your condenser, that's the outside unit, any place near it? Downspouts, what could cause problems with outdoor equipment if you put it near a downspout? It's going to get wet. This is your roof runoff. It's going to get wet. I'm going to dump water onto the outdoor equipment. Not a good idea. I've said this, I said it when we were talking about ductwork placing. What is special about kitchen and lavatories when you're talking about ductwork? Anybody? Exhaust fans? Well, you have exhaust fans in both. Now, what don't you have in both? There's a specific type of ductwork I do not put in return. either of these locations. What was that? Return. Yeah, return ducts. I don't put return ducts in kitchen or lavatories. Kitchen because of the grease and lavatory for lack of any better way, the smells. I don't want that being sucked back into the system and redistributed through a building. So we never put return duct work in kitchen or right. lavatories. Okay, I only put supply duct work in there, and because I have an exhaust fan, if the air pressure in those rooms gets too high, it's going to force itself out through the exhaust. I'm fine with that. In a large commercial building, I'm going to put more air than necessary into a lavatory for this exact reason. Return air. This is one you got to watch for. Return air, RA. Okay, it's a pretty important one. It tells you where the return ducts are. Okay, sometimes just the return register, REG, normally means supply duct. It's a supply register. Okay, and water closet is just a different name for a restroom. For some reason, some people call the half baths water closets in houses. So those are some of the typical abbreviations found in there, okay, on prints. And again, always look at the first page of the print or, because it normally has the legends. It tells you what it is right there, okay. So, like, if I look at a blueprint here, 
Okay, it's going to tell me the key to the materials, which is right there. Okay, it's going to tell me what the what each each substance on the print says. Okay, it's going to tell me what it looks like. So when I see this diagram, okay, I can go over here and look at the house construction, okay, and I know what it's talking about. Okay, and I can look at the different views. I have the front elevation, I have the rear, okay, and it's going to tell me what it is just by looking at it. And there's also notes here. These are those lines with the arrows and notes that I talked to you, that I showed you in the book. Okay, approximate grade, which is this, which is this right here. Approximate grade is important because when I'm when I'm setting an outside unit, let's say I'm setting a condenser right here. I need to know where the grade is. That's the line of dirt. That's the top of the landscaping. I need to know where that is so I can plan my length of my line set that I'm going to run out of the condenser and most likely up to the attic through the wall and I'm going to put my air handler someplace up here in the attic. Okay, so I need to know the different lengths so I can plan on material, plan on insulation, and plan on because I have to like do things like I have to put a concrete pad right here. Okay, because legally I have to put something under the condenser to keep it steady. I can't just put it on dirt. So all of that comes into play knowing where the grade is, knowing the heights of the buildings, knowing what the siding material is, knowing where the downspouts are. Because if there's a downspout right here, I'm not going to put the condenser there. Okay, so that's that's why I need to know like the legends and stuff like that. I need to be able to fully understand where the buildings are. Okay, so now print again. So if you're looking at a print, okay, this is a floor plan and this happens to be electrical. Um, let me see if I can flip this page. Might not be able to. Okay. Um, this is a blue. This is basically what we're looking at is a blueprint. Um, it's the electrical plan of a house. Okay. So when you're looking at this, all it has on it is the wiring component. This is very specific for the electricians. Okay. You're going to have one of these for mechanical. You're going to have one of these for plumbing, and then you're going to have an overall print that shows everything together. So they just use, their schematics are a little bit different. They use these wires. Let me blow this up to specific one. Okay. They basically have, okay, there's a switch over here, and it tells you goes to something else. Okay, same thing here. These little curved wires in here that are connecting to light fixtures. Okay, so you have a switch, you have a switch, and it's doing something over there. Okay, so again, it's, these are the electrical plans. Okay, this is basically the rest. You have a restroom here, men's and women's. Okay, and all of these lines are just the Romix wires that they pull from one location to another. Elevator shafts are extremely important. Okay, because when you look at an elevator shaft, you see that there's an elevator. It looks like you have plenty of room around the outside. There's just one problem. According to code, we can't run any wiring or ductwork in an elevator shaft. Not allowed to, even if I could fit it next to the elevator. Elevator shafts are protected fire zones in commercial buildings. I'm not allowed to run anything in an elevator shaft. Okay, and again, there's electrical keynotes. Okay, tells you exactly what is being done, what needs to be done. So it's something to keep in mind as you're looking at prints, because again, you're not going to run wiring or ductwork where they need to run their electrical, where their lights are and everything else. Can't do it. So 
when we start looking at our um, end of chapter for this, okay, basically just match A to whatever it is, okay, this is just a matching, this one should not take you that long to do, okay, that's the end of chapter for um, chapter 4, chapter 4 is not a long chapter, all you're doing is talking about lines and some symbols, okay, the activity, the first activity that I'm asking you to do, basically draw the lines. Okay, I've given you this, I've given you the different lines, it's right in your chapter. Okay, we have a property line, okay, you have an object line. All we're asking you to do, and I can't do this on here because of how it is on my ebooks, but all we're asking you to do is draw the appropriate line in here. Okay, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have paper on this, Okay, just one, two, and three, just draw the line, snap a picture of it, upload it. Okay, I'm not asking for anything special on this. We just want to understand that you know the lines. Okay, there's an activity two here, if I remember right. Just tell me what the symbols are. Okay, there's a symbol key in your book. Okay, that talks about the plumbing symbols, talks about the electrical symbols. Okay, just tell us what the symbols are. That's all I'm looking for, okay? Like switch, okay? An outlet, a switched outlet, okay? All of that stuff, this is a 13 is a valve, shut off valve. Um, 12, okay, it's a T or a branch line. Same thing here, okay? So we're looking for what the symbols are, okay? Could be a rock wall down here on 17. 18 <coughs> is a buried electrical line. Okay, it's outside, it's topographical, it's buried electrical service. By the way, don't dig there. Um, so again, the symbols are there, they're on your blueprints. Um, 21 could be a lake or a pond. A lot of people have water on their property. Does it make a difference if I have water on my property? Yeah, it really does in how you're setting equipment, because I'm not going to put any equipment near the water. So exercises 4-1 four, four, and 4-2 just have to do with identifying these symbols, okay? Between the two of them should not take you long to complete. Questions on Chapter 4 or the exercises for Chapter 4? Okay, chapter five is one of these chapters we do not spend a lot of time on, okay? I'm not asking you guys to be draft, draftsmen. I'm not asking you guys to be able to really draw a lot of, um, I don't need you to really know how to draw detail, okay? What I want you to be able to do when we're done with chapter five and the reason we at all cover Chapter 5 and have you guys look at it is because you do occasionally, when you're in the field, have to draw out a freehand sketch of a building, section of ductwork, furnace, or something like that. So, example, you come up on a house with a bad furnace, okay? You have two choices in most companies. You can call the sales guy out okay, to basically do the sale, do the whole process, and you'd basically just get out of there as soon as you turn it over to a sales guy. But most companies allow their technicians to make a little bit of extra money. Most companies will say, okay, cool, you found the bad furnace. If you can sell and design the replacement while you're on site and bring it back to the office to the, to the install coordinator, okay, with certain things like a sketch of the ductwork measurements and so on and so forth, then we're going to give you a commission off that furnace. Company I worked for, I got a 15% commission off of every replacement piece of equipment I sold. So, I mean, that's nothing, that's not a drop in the bucket to add to your paycheck every, every time because we were selling replacement furnaces for about the $8,000 mark. Think about a 15% commission and do two or three of these a week added to your paycheck. You can actually get a lot of additional money if you do this right. So this is why I want you to be able to do at least do some drawing. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're never going to draw this stuff totally to scale, 
but if you have the basic drawing and measurements, you're going to be able to make some extra money and actually do well with the company you're working for because nine out of ten times when the technician leaves while they're waiting for the salesman to come up, they've made three other phone calls and they're always going to go to the cheapest bidder. So if you can take care of everything while you're on site, make an honest sale, you know what? Technicians carry a lot of credibility as long as you never break that credibility. Um, just to give you an idea, my base salary with with the last company that I worked for, with the HVAC company, I was making about 52k a year. That was my base pay. The last year I was in the field, I brought in 98,000, and the difference was the commissions on my sales. So that's, I mean, you can really make a difference in your paycheck if you have the ability to spec out equipment and do this on your own rather than turn it over to this person. So we want you to be able to make some proper freehand sketches. Now, that's not saying you're going to be a draftsman. I don't expect that. Okay, but this whole chapter is about basically telling you how, giving you suggestions on how to draw. Now, am I really ever anymore going to draw on paper? No. Okay, I have this nifty tool called PDF Expert. I use it on my iPad when I'm in the field doing things. Um, and it gives me probably better drawings as well. So glance through this chapter. Don't spend a lot of time on it, but if you can pick up anything out of it, like how to do the darkened lines, short lines, and stuff like that, that's what we want you to be able to do. Now, the reality is I'm going to come into PDF Expert for drawing. Okay, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to create a new empty document nine out of ten times. Okay, I'm going to have it in landscape mode. And when I come in and draw my house, I'm going to come in and draw whatever section starting off with the square of the house. Now, because we all know sometimes houses have weird shapes, okay, I'm going to come down and draw out. I'm going to start with the basic square. Whenever I do a house, I start with the basic square. Then I'll come in and I'll label one side of it front. I'll label the other side of it back. Okay, and I always go and I take a, you have to know for heat load which direction faces south. That's extremely important. Does anybody know why I need to know the south facing part of a house? Anybody? The sun hits? The sun. Yeah, both of you are right. It's where the sun hits. Okay, so it's very important to know the direction that that house is facing. So what we always try to do is we always try to put an arrow facing towards the north. Okay, that's a standard on the print. The arrow is facing north like you would have with a compass. And then we also normally, I just throw a when I'm turning this over, I just throw the letter north onto it. It's sort of just in case somebody doesn't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I know that the front of this house is facing north. Okay, which again is sort of important. Then what we do is we start thinking about, okay, where's our doors? Okay, now doors are signified in a building, okay, always by basically it's a just a line that comes that way, okay? And again, I'll erase this later in here to show the opening. Windows are done sort of the same way. You just draw the window in where the window goes, okay? Now, all of these are extremely important when you have building measurements, okay? Like this is a three by six window, okay? If I have a four by, well, I, four is a little bit too high, by 7.5 door. Okay, so these measurements are probably the most important thing you can get when you go out and measure a house and start drawing a building. Okay, and what you do is you basically start off with the outside. So you take and you just start off and get where it is outside. The neater you do this, the better off you are. So, for example, here, okay, I might have a garage door. Okay, and you label, you can, if it's not obvious what it is, 
you can actually throw a label in here. Metal garage door. Okay, you can throw a label in. And again, you give it the measurements. Why do I here. care about windows, doors, and garage doors? Why is that my biggest concern when I'm drawing a building? Measurements for ductwork and all that. Um, yeah, knowing where the ductwork is, but there's one other thing about windows and doors specifically. Heat loss or transfer? Heat transfer. Okay, heat transfer. So a window obviously has a lot of heat transfer when the sun's beating on it. Okay. I took a picture of my garage door on ours on our one project we had to do a couple of days ago there, Chris. Yeah, I saw you. that. Yeah. Okay. Some of those pictures, by the way, were really good about possible air quality issues and stuff like that. So that that was that was really good. Uh, got some good pictures and got some good uh, good thoughts about that. But I really care about the front doors, the windows, the garage doors. Um, anything where I have heat transfer. Now, between a garage, okay, let me just draw something in here. Actually, that isn't what I wanted. I don't mean to interrupt, but is this what you want to, is this what you, how, like, how you want us to do ours when we start doing it? This is one of the ways you can do it. I mean, you can definitely do it on paper and pen. Or pencil, don't use pen. It looks well, crappy. Well, I mean, as far as, like, the drawing itself is going Absolutely. So far. That's why I'm starting to do this, okay? I'm starting to get you guys to take a look at how we're going to do this project. This is absolutely what you're going to be doing. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So when we look at this, what we're just starting to do is we're starting to build out, okay, what we're the whole idea of this, um, you're starting to build out what you need. Okay, I have a metal garage door. Well, you know what? I have to have a spot between the house and the garage. Okay, so I know that I have a door coming in someplace here. Okay, and then I know that I have... Uh, Again, I'm going to remove some lines here eventually to make interior openings, but I start with the shell of the building. Okay? And so outside of the building is really important. Again, if you use if you can use PDF Expert for those of you who do this on your iPad, you have a lot of tools there. If you can use um for those of you who have PCs, Okay, I know there's a lot of people who use the draw, whatever it is, the drawing program that's in there. Um, there's other stuff out there. So there's a lot of good ways to draw this, again, if you have on your computer. But again, you are more than welcome to do this on your paper and pencil. So chap getting back to Chapter 5 before I got off track, okay, is um, all about drawing. Now, again, they're talking freehand. We don't do a lot of freehand drawing anymore, which is why I'm not beating this chapter to death. Okay, they talk a little bit about CAD. I'm not asking you guys to be CAD guys. I don't expect things to be perfect. Okay, but I do expect you to be able to understand um, angles and circles and stuff like that. Again, PDF Expert has all of those tools inside of it. Um, hey, Chris. What was that? Um, do you want us, uh, do we have to, like, label the measurements and things like that up to scale? Or are we just doing a rough drawing for our project? I don't expect it to be to scale. In other words, i really not expecting the quarter inch per foot or whatever it is like that, but you are going to have to label the measurements, and okay. it should look relatively in proportion. Right. Okay. Okay, in other words, if you have a 50-foot side of a building, it should look longer than the 25-foot side. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, the, the other key is, let me skip back over to the drawing. Okay, the other key is, let's say, and I don't know this off the top of my head, so these measurements will probably change over time, but if I have a measurement from here to here, 
Okay, let's say that I have, uh, let's say that just for the fun of it, and I don't think this is right, let's say I have a 25-foot measurement there, okay? When I start drawing my interior rooms in, which we haven't gotten to yet, okay, what they are going to have to all add up to roughly this outside measurement. So I want, so when you start, when you start doing this, you do the exterior of the building as a guideline to make sure you're not messing up interior room measurements. Make sense? Absolutely. Okay. For those of you who are going to jump ahead, and I know some of you guys are going to do this, do the exterior of the house first. We still have a few things we have to talk about with interior measurements. Don't try to do interior rooms yet. Okay? And don't label things like ductwork and stuff like that. We're going to pretend in our floor plan, once you have the floor plan laid out, that nothing exists. Okay? We're going to start from scratch and design a system that is up to current standards in the building. Okay, so don't label any like ductwork returns or anything like that. Don't make assumptions on what is currently there. Because you know what? There's differences that if a house was built in 1970, 1980, 2000, 2015, there's differences over the years. And I think there's a few people that um, probably live in older farmhouse type structures and some of the older structures um, are going to actually be very interesting to put a modernized system into. So don't make any assumptions based on systems that are currently installed. So what we want to do is we want to start off with a floor plan, and we want to start off at that point. So again, don't jump ahead and do the interior rooms yet. If you guys do get started on this, doing exterior walls is a great, is a great way to go. Okay, and again, use a tool you're comfortable with. I'm fine with paper and pencil. Okay, you guys can snap pictures and give me what I need to see. But um, I, this is just a tool I use. I always like PDF Expert. It's been good to me. And, I, and again, it works on a Mac laptop as well. So that's what I use. Okay. So proportion is important. Again, as I just said, make sure a side that's 50 feet long in real life looks longer than a size that's 40 foot or 20 foot long. Okay, we got to be proportional. Try to keep your corners at true right angles because it's really going to mess up your measurements if it's not at a right angle. Okay, while I'm not going to insist for your drawings on a scale, sometimes it's easier to draw to a one foot is a quarter inch or one foot is an eighth inch. But I leave that up to you to decide, okay? I'm not going to beat anybody up for being slightly out of scale but the measurements have to make sense. Okay, graph paper, if you're doing it on paper. Okay, when I was first in the field, a matter of fact, when I left the field, we didn't have um, PDF experts. Um, iPads were just coming out. So I didn't have a lot of these tools. My laptop weighed, oh, probably three tons. Um, it was stuff like that. So we didn't have a lot of these tools, so it was easier to take a clipboard and graph paper okay, um, to do my measurements on. Because I knew if the graph paper, every cell was like a quarter inch. So I could very easily draw to scale using graph paper with a quarter inch equals a foot, and I could get, I could get a building drawn relatively fast. So again, there's different ways to do this. And however you do it, just try to get lines straight as possible and proportional. Um, I always carry a ruler in my truck. It's just the way it is. I carry graph paper to this day still. Okay, don't worry about doing any side views. I, I again, that's something I'm gonna would ask a CAD student to do. I just want floor plans. We're not worried about side views. Now, having said that, does height of walls make a difference? Does the height of the outside and interior walls make a difference? Absolutely. Where am I going to use the height of the walls? For air volume. Yeah, air volume for ventilation rates. But believe it or not, 
I'm going to use it for heat load as well. Okay, so if I have a south-facing wall that's 10 feet tall and has dark siding on it or dark brick, it's going to make a bigger heat load or it's going to provide a bigger target for the sun, for lack of better words, than if I have an 8-foot wall, okay, on the south-facing side of the house with different colored brick and, or siding. So all of this has to do with heat loads. So everything that we're doing moving forward from this point, I really want you to be looking at how am I going to use this to come up with my heat and cooling loads for the building, okay? Because that's what we're, that's our end goal, okay, is the heat and cooling load. Again, so when you're looking at your building, okay, and let me jump back over here, you are going to need to know what the wall height is, okay? And you're going to need to know what the wall is constructed of. Don't worry about that for now. I'll tell you how to do that as we start talking more about that. But you are eventually going to need to know. Now, how I always do this, okay, just to have that, I basically, for my own records, I never turn these in, but for my own records, when I'm looking at this, okay, I walk around the building and I take some pictures, okay, and that goes in my file that when I'm doing a job, I just keep a file on. Uh, okay, I put it in the same file folder as this. That way, when I'm sitting at my, my desk later, and I have to know what material that wall is, how high it is, what's on that wall, okay? And just as a cross-reference to take a look at what is what I might have missed, okay? Because I, someplace along the way, you're going to miss a window or a door, and you're going to scratch your head and say, okay, what was that? Okay, it's good to have some pictures so you have that information, so you don't have to go back to a building again. Okay, and again, when I was when I was finishing up in the field, we didn't have great digital cameras. Okay, again, my digital camera was pretty bad. So, okay, so again, front view, side views. I'm not worried about how you draw them. Okay, I'm more worried about your where what's on the sides of the buildings. What's there? Okay. Not worried about um, plan views. Okay, again, elevations. We just talked about elevations. I just care, you know, how tall the wall is, how tall the window is, how far off the ground the window is. Okay. That, those are the important things. Okay. Um, Rear elevation, left side elevation, front elevation, I do all of these now with pictures. When I'm looking at a building that I'm drawing out, I do all of these with pictures. Okay, I look at the front, I look at the left, I, or the rear left and front and right. Okay, roof plan. If you want to get a good picture of a building, what's something you can use without climbing on the roof? You want a top-down view of your house or your building. What's something you can use? Google. Google. Google Earth. I use it all the time. Um, if I'm going to a house I've never seen before, if I'm going to a property to do an inspection for a hurricane claim or something like that, and I want to see what the building looked like before, I go to Google. It's a couple months old, but buildings don't move overnight. Okay, so I use a lot of Google Earth View. It's awesome. Okay, it's a great way to find out what the top down of a building is. What's something else I can use to get information about a building in a lot of areas? Does anybody know that your building departments a lot of times have all the building plans online? You can actually go to the building department's permitting system, and you can sometimes find, especially for buildings built after 1990, you can find the plans, the floor plans, in the original permits for the, build, for the construction. So a lot of times you can find a lot of good information online at, the, at your county or um, city's building department, especially if it's a larger, larger area. Okay, they've modernized. I'm pretty sure, I haven't looked at York's building office, 
Um, but it, but they might, they're big enough that they might actually have most of everything online that you can get to. So don't forget about those other, other things you can look for. Google Earth is great. Okay, use it all the time. Google, especially on commercial buildings. A lot of the work I do in the field lately, my side work, I do insurance inspections. Okay, if I get a call that, hey, we had a windstorm, it blew all the rooftop units over on the roof. Before I even go out to that building, I pull a Google Earth satellite view of that roof. I want to see what it was three, four, five months ago. Okay, because who knows? It might be a new landlord, and all those units were blown over three, four, five months ago, and I can guarantee it's not a hurricane or wind damage claim. Okay, so again, Google Earth is awesome. Okay, floor plans. Don't worry about it right now. I really want to talk more about floor plans where I'm going to continue working on this drawing that I started as we go over the next couple days, and we're going to talk a little bit about floor plans. Um, your outside measurements, the biggest, most important thing to realize is your measurement outside from the corner to whatever other corner you're going for is not going to equal the inside measurement. This will not equal this. Anybody know why? Because of the thickness of the wall. Exactly. Wall thickness. This is for some reason something a lot of people struggle with. My inside measurement is not going to equal my outside measurement. Okay? But taking an inside measurement and an outside measurement accurately gives me a lot of information about that wall, like exactly how thick it is. Okay? Because walls can sometimes be made up of four or five layers. Okay? If I have my outside wall, eh, let me, I wanted a box. Okay, if I have my outside wall, I might have first brick. Then I might have a layer of insulation. Okay, so I might have my insulation. Then I might have what we call an air gap. I might have sheathing. Okay, then I'll have my inside wall. So our outside walls are made up of more than one substance. This can sometimes be six inches thick, eight inches thick, or sometimes I've seen a foot thick, depending on the building you're in. Okay, so it's very important to realize my inside measurements and my outside measurements do not equal, but this, the difference is extremely important. So again, don't get crazy with your inside measurements. I want to talk more about that before you spend a lot of time on it. And again, this is not even close to due yet, so you have time on this. I just started to talk about it, and we're going to go much through, so don't get crazy on it. Okay. Um, so again, once we're all said and done, we're going to have our outside measurements. We're going to have our inside measurements. We're going to have all our windows placed. Okay, our outside measurements, we, do, we are going to probably draw with some sort of lines to show that it's a measurement, sort of important. Okay, we're going to have um, placement of where things are. Okay, again, do I care about where things are like furniture? No, I could care less about furniture. But do I care where, like in the kitchen, where the island is and where the stove is and where the sink is? Why do I care about these three items in a kitchen? Island, stove, and sink. Why do I care about locations? Anybody? Gas lines. Water lines. Yep, gas lines, water lines. What about with placement of supply registers? Why do I care about these things with placement of supply registers? Well, because of the exhaust fans near them. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have an exhaust fan over the stove. But let me ask a question. Would it be a good idea in summer months to be blowing cold air down on the stove? No. Nah. Uh, might make people upset if there's cold air blowing down on the stove. 
What about on the island? Do I want a supply register blowing air on that island? Oh, no, it'll cool all the food down. <laughs> it will cool the food down, but there's something else, too. Let's talk about dust. Do I want to take a chance of blowing dust in an airstream down onto the food? Oh. Now, that would be pretty nasty. Oh, see, that's where food prep is done a lot of times, too, so... You don't yep. Want... Yeah. Okay, so I want to make sure that my grills and my vents don't blow air at these two directions or these two locations. Okay, do I really care about air blowing over sink? Probably not. Okay, the only thing is we do have people standing in front of the sink a lot of times, so do I, if I have a ceiling register, I might not want to blow a heavy air stream down at the sink, but I would probably not have a problem blowing a little air down here. What about hot air under the sink? I'm not sure if anyone has seen them. They're the under the sink registers that go into the sort of the baseboard of the sink. Okay, would that be a good place to have a warm air register? Yeah. Okay, because people standing in front of a sink sometimes sometimes have cold feet and it's nice on a warm morning to have that warm air blowing out. It's a comfort factor. Okay, but again, if I'm using the same ductwork for cooling, probably not the best idea because it's a mid, because you will pay the price if you blow cold air out from there. You'll get complaints all the time. So it's, again, this is just a start looking at where things are, where things make sense to be. Okay, and again, front of the building, okay, all I want you to be able to look at as we start doing our heat load, and it doesn't have to go on your prints, it doesn't have to go on your drawings, is I want you to be able to say, okay, the roof has black shingles on it. Makes a difference for heating and cooling loads. Okay, um, I recently had to replace my roof, and I went from, they had a dark, a very dark, almost black shingle on it when the house was built. I have no clue why. And we went to a whitish roof color. Well, it actually makes a tremendous difference on air conditioning costs. So this roof colors make a big difference. Outside colors make a big difference. So when you start looking at a building, you have to start looking at the colors of things. Again, do I need it drawn? No. But do you need to know it? Yes, because of the heating and cooling loads. Okay, because when we start looking closer down, Okay, we're going to be looking at, we're going to have to be able to figure out what the walls are made out of. Okay, what's in them? Okay, this is a wood frame wall, okay, with possibly a brick outside. You can see the darker lines, okay, the frame walls. Okay, joists are, the wall joists or the studs are normally 16 inch off center. Doesn't mean they actually are. They're supposed to be, but for those of you who have done work on your own house, I can guarantee you found areas where those studs are not 16 inches. Okay, I mean it's it's something frustrating a lot of times. So it's important to know what's in these outside walls. Okay, and the reason is we're going to have to use that information for heat load. Now, what's the easiest way to find out what's in an outside wall? in terms of insulation, what it's made out of. What's your easiest way? Anybody? I mean, if there's a small, like a dryer duct or something you can remove to peek inside, you can get a good cross-section. Yup, if you have a dryer duct that you can look at, but I can guarantee everybody's outside wall has an electrical outlet on it someplace. A lot of times you can take a flashlight and look next to the box without touching anything in the box. You just take that little cover off, look, take a flashlight, look to the right or left of the box, and a lot of times you can see what's on that outside wall. There's another way, and that's to if you have a basement, you can look up towards the outside wall, and you can actually see the bottom view of the wall a lot of times. It will tell you what's on that outside wall. So, And then sometimes you don't know, so you basically have to be a little bit creative and say, okay, this looks like has insulation, has bricks, 
Okay, we know general building practices have us take, we have sheetrock, so we want to have a basic idea of what the outside wall is made out of. Does it have to be exact? No, but we need to have a basic idea. And again, this drawing chapter shows you how to draw it in detail. Am I looking for this detail? No. Okay. So again, the only thing that I'm having you do on this chapter, okay, is I do want you just to do the multiple choice, okay. Um, there, they're pretty easy. Again, if you don't have the paper, just just write it, just write it down on a piece of paper or type it into the blank. Okay, it's just a multiple choice based on the material in the chapter. I'm, I don't want you to do the exercises. It, they're just they're not where I want you guys to be spending your time. Okay, so activities five two five one five three five four and five 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 six we're not going to do now five. Five, five, we're going to do, I'm going to sign off on that based on your floor plan eventually. Okay, so again, I'm going to skip over it because you're going to be doing it anyways. Questions on Chapter 5? Okay, Chapter 6 starts talking about specifications. Now, when we looked at our blueprints, Okay, when we originally looked at those large, or the blueprints that I keep showing you going back to, okay, we have a section on every print called specifications. Let me find this one. Okay, top left-hand corner, okay, of this print, we have an area of specifications. Okay, this tells us, and it's on every blueprint out there, every set of prints out there, tells us what the design is, what are the loads, what are the requirements, how do they come in accordance with codes. Okay, for example, the design load. Okay, if I have a second floor with a 10, 10 pounds per square foot dead load, and that's what this is showing you, okay, that means that I cannot have in one square foot more than 10 pounds sitting there. Okay, that's what my design load is. So if, I, if the homeowner decided to move their grand piano up to the second floor, it's very likely that the four or five legs on that grand piano are going to go over the design load for that floor. Now there's two numbers that they use on loads, live load and dead load. Okay, live load is people. You're walking around. You're not standing in one spot forever, okay? So you're up where you're walking around. Dead load is it's sitting in one place forever and it's not moving. Now, why do I bring this to everyone's attention? It's very simple because you're installing boilers a lot of times. You're installing heavy equipment. You might be installing water heaters. Okay, you have to be very aware of what the load is for that portion of the building, especially if it's a new installation. If that architect is telling me to stick my 800 pound boiler on the second floor in a utility closet, and if I glance at these prints and say that I have a 10 pound per square foot dead load, I'm going to, before I even make a move to install that boiler, I'm going to say to the architect, um, yeah, I can't quite do that because I'm going to exceed the limitations of that second floor. So what are you going to do to engineer so that I can raise that air, so to raise that load capability to the second floor? Because the last thing you want to do in new construction is have that boiler fall through the floor into the first floor, then the basement. Okay, so it's very important to, even though there's an architect that's been paid to do this, a mechanical engineer that's been paid to do this, you as a technician don't ever want to install something unsafe. So that's why we care about the design loads. Okay, a roof load. Why do I care about a roof load on a commercial building? Anybody? The rooftop units. Rooftop units. Okay, if my roof load can't handle the weight of a rooftop unit, what's going to happen when I have the crane drop that rooftop unit onto the roof? It's going to go right through. Okay, and I'm talking about if it's close, because in the northeast part of the country, 
what happens in the winter months to roofs? You guys get snow. So whatever the weight of the equipment is, it's going to increase when snow starts falling on the roof and accumulating on the roof. So again, I need to be very aware of what my roof loads are, what my floor loads are when I'm installing equipment. Of course, if it goes in the basement, do I really care? No, because it's a concrete slab and none of my equipment is going to go, is going to exceed the concrete slab that's in the basement, okay? It's just not going to happen. But if it's second, third, rooftop, yeah, I'm worried about this stuff. Okay, so moving back. Okay, so Chapter 6 is all about specifications. Okay, the Construction Specification Institute, they're the ones that developed the master format. Okay, the divisions are standard. Division 1, general requirements. Division 2, existing conditions. Division 3 is concrete. Division 4 is masonry. Division 5 is metals. Okay, 6 is always going to be the wood, plastics, and composites. Okay, 7 is the thermal and moisture protection. By the way, that includes roofs. It's thermal and moisture protection. It doesn't say roofs, but it's thermal moisture. Division 8 is always openings, which is windows and stuff like that. Okay, so we worry about stuff like that. Okay, so all of those specifications, okay, then you have any related documents. So if there's building codes, if there's warranties, if there's manufacturer specifications, that's all going to be referenced in the specifications. Okay, lists all the products, how they're going to be installed, how they're going to be protected. Example of this, okay, would be like warranty. Who's responsible and what is required when the work is turned over to the owner of the building? Okay, because until it's turned over, until a certificate of occupancy is issued, you guys own it. But the bill, once the building is turned over, who's responsible for the maintenance and upkeep at least through the first year? Then you have what's required for maintenance. All of this is always listed under the specification section. Okay, building codes. The International Building Code is our standard. Okay, it's what all other codes are built on. Now, every municipality has the option to increase the level of codes, okay? In other words, if a municipality says the equipment has to be, or if international code says it's 13 SEER, which is a rating of efficiency on air conditioners, a municipality has the option to say, no, in our, in our jurisdiction, we are going to insist on 15 SEER. So where do you find this information? What's the best thing you can do before you start like a new installation? Where do you find this? Anybody? Okay, you can go to the building code department. Okay, you can go to the building department and just ask them. That's how you find out this stuff. Okay, it's, a, it's really easy to do. Just call them. They would rather ask. So again, for the test your knowledge end of Chapter 6, you're just matching where you find these different things in the division. It's just a matching exercise. Okay, for example, there was something in here about roofing. Okay, um, well, let's say thermostat. You know it's Q, Division 23. Okay, sinks belongs to plumbing. Okay, which is Division 22. So all we're doing is asking you to match the ones in column in the first column to the second one. Okay, just to, and again, it's to get to make sure you know where to find things. Do I expect you to remember this forever? No, but I expect you to know, be able to know where to find it. Okay. Um, and then you can just come up with some some um, ideas and use the chapter, list some effective codes applicable to your community, international mechanical code, international building code, international residential code, are all examples of this, okay? The international code series 
is great for this. Okay, activity 6-1. Okay, I am asking you to do this activity. Now, there's something special about this activity. Okay, there's a partial on the following pages after the activity, and I put this in the, I put this in the assignment. There is a follow, there's a couple print pages after this in your book, and I'll show you. So, you want to make sure that you refer to the print, okay, or to the sections following this page, okay. If I go to basically here, this is the specifications, it's two pages after, okay. It actually gives you supplemental prints, and that's what this exercise is referring to. Okay, it doesn't want you, to, so exercise 6-1 refers to the prints sections that are two pages after this. So this is the front and the back, and the print sections we're referring to starts right there. Okay, so again, where are you going to find windows? Okay, you're going to find windows in openings, Division 8. Roofs, okay, is in Division 7. Okay, masonry, outside brickwork, Division 4. Okay, fire suppression, plumbing. Fire suppression, we're really interested in in HVAC techs, especially in commercial buildings. We do play a role in that. So just match up the divisions where you find the different things. That's all, I'm, that's all we're really asking in Chapter 6. So does anybody have any questions on Chapter 6?